my dearest friends, thank you so much for joining me. I'm um, situated in the French Pyrenees at the moment, so it's my evening. But you know what? I should have been with you. We had this scheduled for a real in-person event. I was going to do a US and Canada tour to help promote this book. But of course, our good friend COVID came along and uh, I am still here in the French Pyrenees. The first thing I'd love to share about this book is that when it came out in January 2020, I was a little bit frustrated because I'd written the book two years ago and I wanted it to come out in 2019. But Inner Traditions was saying, no, 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 trust in our methods. This is going to come out January 2020. And I was like, oh man, that's too late. Little did we know what was around the corner. Because I was sure that I had covered current events that led us to that sort of 2019 moment. And that the timing of 2019 would have been the perfect jumping off point to really be able to comprehend and understand what this book was pointing towards. But its actual launch was horribly perfect for the era we are in now. The Us Feminine Rising is nothing to do with women. Let me just dispel that myth. It is about the feminine presence and cry and anguish and helplessness that is rising in man, woman and child. So I wish for us to, to grasp that one first and foremost. When I was writing the book, it became extremely clear that this was a body of wisdom for the outer world and the inner world and that whatever you applied to the outer was the same as the inner and vice versa. It was a living transmission. The way I wrote it was through spoken word. I understood very clearly this is not a book that writes itself like my previous ones. It is not about me writing, handwriting in my journal, making notes, and then coming to the keyboard. The whole thing had to be spoken first, and then the sentences would appear on the page. So I had to find something called Dragon Software, which I rather liked the name of, so I was quite okay with that. What I noticed, because it was my spoken voice that was getting recorded, the articulation, the vocabulary, and the sentencing and paragraphs were profoundly different from my written word. I would send a couple of pages to my nearest and dearest, and they recognized, this is your speaking voice. This isn't how you write. And I must say, everybody preferred it. <laughs> I think only because they recognized it was exactly how I speak. But that for me was a, uh, hmm, now that's interesting, because it was a different vibration and a different resonance. What I want to bring through so early in the talk is this. Now, I have no evidence <laughs> for what I'm about to say. This is just coming from pure knowing, and it brings a great good feeling when I imagine it and say it. Because we haven't seen the feminine in her fullest glory for a long, 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 long while, this statement might sound out of the box, 
But one thing we do know about the fierce feminine, not the fierce feminine, about the sacred feminine, is in ancient times when there has been that level of divinity upon the planet and in everyday life, the feminine always holds those who have erred or come out of balance to accountability. Now, I hope that brings you a huge wave of good news, because if you're anything like me, you're looking at the news, you're looking at the Facebook feeds, you're noticing how everything is amping up and amping up. And you're probably wondering, because I know I am, how and will those who have erred be held accountable? The fierce feminine, the sacred feminine, will eventually bring that to pass. There will be an accountability, an integration, and then a transformation. So that is glorious good news. In the book, I think I got as far as the fires in the Amazon and the fires in Australia. That was where I was leading the reader to look at this and to look at that and to notice the patterning and to notice the building up. And then, of course, as we come into this year, we have the paedophilia rings, we have Hollywood, we have COVID, we have um, Epstein, so we have more in our melting pot. So by the time you read this, we will all be coming on the same page. The number one golden rule about this book is not to provide even more data, facts, knowledge, names, places, and who's doing what, and, and the lineage of who's doing what, and how that actually goes probably even further back than the Romans, than the ancient Greeks. But there is clearly some kind of ghost in the machine, some kind of element that has been here since the beginning of time, getting involved every now and again with trying to dominate, trying to control, and trying to submit. And this is what is really coming to the surface now. And it shall be the feminine part of man, woman, and child that shall address this head on, but through a state of feeling. So it's not really so much the gathering of research and going down the rabbit hole, although that's necessary and needed, but it's more about allowing what we're reading to actually take some ground inside of us and do what it needs to do, which is to awaken our numbness, to stir and rouse any apathy, any hopelessness, despair, or disbelief. Slowly, the scales are being taken off our eyes and we're able to see with cool sobriety just what has been going on forever. What is the difference? Here's a classic question. What is the difference between the fierce feminine and an angry bitch? That's a, po a, a, a question posed by my husband. <laughs> Quite a lot, I said, whilst spluttering morning coffee out of my cup. <laughs> the fierce feminine is not personally angry or offended or judging or shaming or blaming in any way. Her energy is much wider than that. It's like a wide screen wall of unapologetic and uncompromising no. It is the line in the sand that gets made. And when it's spoken, when it's heard, 
that no is realized to be a very staunch and immovable no. But we cannot get there yet whilst we have all of this conditioning and armoring and fear of loudness and fear of directness and fear of allowing that energy to come through all of our chakras until it hits the voice and literally bellows out of us. And for some ladies, it's not all traditions, but some traditions, and of course, myself being half British, I can really relate to this, that uh, level of sacred rage or holy wrath is something that maybe we have been extremely uncomfortable about accessing. But access it, we must. But first, let me dispel that myth. It is not your permission to let all your own personal anger come through you and start to harm others. In the book, there's a, a great little chapter called Sacred Rage, where I go into detail on how I actually did it. <laughs> I live down in the French Pyrenees and I uh, seeked out an old Knights Templar castle ruins to actually start getting into this energy. Before I opened that up, I did a huge prayer to Carly because I knew I could get in contact with it, but I was afraid that if I did, that my character might change permanently, or I might blow a few fuses in my nervous system and brain, or I would maybe stay that level of anger and wickedness for the rest of my days. So I had a heck of a lot of fears, what I call an electric fence, all around that that sacred necessity to release the rage and the anger. And so I did that frightening prayer. And for, for certain, a very powerful and divine presence seemed to embrace itself around me. And I was able to absolutely get in contact with the personal anger raise it right up and out through mad hysterical shouting and sounding until a like a white fire clarity came absolutely through and that's why i say it's widescreen it didn't want to zone in and point the finger at one person or establishment it was extremely clean and extremely pure and uh, I knew because I could hear it no one would question this and it was so healing and so sorrowful and so not so much joyful but uh, a gratitude came through as I realized wow I am getting there I feel we saw a beautiful example of the fierce feminine not so long ago in the city of Portland, Oregon, where we saw that young woman, Athena, in all of her nakedness, facing what looked like to me, I might be wrong, a line of military police. And I saw the whole the whole footage from the beginning she just comes out of the crowd she's already naked apart from her boots and her beanie and she sits down on the ground she finds a quiet place people are trying to follow her because they sort of recognize and feel something's about to happen <laughs> she's like go away go away I just want my my spot and she sat down and in a very ancient way she opened her legs to face the wall of military police. And of course, there were so many posts the next day and uh, a lot of people were digging around and finding stories and blogs and articles of how women had done that in the past. Now, to me, that is a beautiful example. 
who can question that? And that is quite what the fierce feminine often does is controversial. It's way out of the box. It's spontaneous. It's unpredictable. It's pretty chaotic and wild. But if you actually look back and say, was anybody actually harmed? The answer is a very far reaching no. Another aspect of the book running parallel is the same kind of spotlight that we're looking to the outside. We are applying that same spotlight to our own inner thoughts, influences, seductions, and interests. I am of the Gnostic variety. I am a Gnostic Christian, perhaps that's the best way of describing it. So I'm very familiar with this term archon, which means ruler or influence. If we were reading the Bible, it would be known as one of the seven deadly sins. So there's seven tendencies, seven energies in our creation that are here, perhaps, to really make sure we do not access our divinity, our full potential, our full awakening and realization. And their job is to swerve us just at the two minutes to midnight phase, just as we're getting close, it'll come an archon and give us a ridiculous sequence of thoughts or get us angry or jealous or greedy. So whatever methodology is coming through the book, to apply to the outer world and environment and circumstances. The same thing must be applied to the inside and those sort of tempestuous, seductive, wicked, cruel and barbaric thoughts as well. As well. To actually take a breath and here's a good one, be willing to let those thoughts go because they are rather seductive and they're meant to be. That is why the design works so well. They can often give us a sense of empowerment, entitlement, I am right, they are wrong. But it's all coming from one and the same thing, I am suggesting. As you go through the book, because I'm asking the reader to feel, I'm asking the reader to throw off any numbness, any static, any, oh, I'll wait for someone else to do that, and to become roused and to become moved and to, and to allow those important feelings to be felt, to change the biology, to change the brain, to change our frequency and vibration. I've peppered the whole book with my personal 13 sorrows of the world, which is where I get into really deep emotional language because I need that reader to feel those forbidden feelings. Most of my sorrows of the world tend to be around animal welfare. That's kind of my thing. I've spoken a little bit about the Yulin Dog Meat Festival. And of course, two years ago, it was really in its heyday. But because of the Wuhan virus and what has subs subsequently unfolded, there is, or rather there was, no Yulin Dog Meat Festival this summer solstice. So this is like, wow, brilliant, <laughs> brilliant, brilliant. But of course we are still in the midst of a great and timely and essential storm. 
they've even brought our attention to a real story of a lady being stoned to death in the Middle East. Because I needed to know more about that. I'm not going to go into great detail here, read it in the book, hear it on the audio book. But for some of us, um, we will realize that something like that is probably more than we originally knew about. You'll know what I mean when you go and read it. I also bring in the, uh, the myth of technology and the AI. Back in the time of writing it, I heard about um, a vaccine, interestingly enough, that was being made, a vaccine that is connected to the internet. Don't ask me how and why, <laughs> I just followed the research paper. A vaccine that's connected to the internet that's connected to our own biology, the moment it feels the fringes of a virus or a bacteria, a cough, a cold, a sniffle, a rash, it, the vaccine, speaks to the internet and downloads the medicine through the internet into our body. And this technology was being prepped and ready for anti-aging, anti-sickness, and when they really get the methodology right, anti-death. Yeah, that was what AI was promising us back in 2018. So I, I brought that element in. I brought in factory farming things I've actually seen with my own eyes. I brought in Big Pharma. I brought in everything, everything I could to try and rouse and move that reader. But I can see now that doesn't need to happen. We're already being roused and moved because of the actual reality we are currently living through. Personally, and I, I know many of us on this call will agree, I've always felt that something like this was going to happen in my lifetime. Not because I'm well researched or psychic. I knew since I was a little girl. I don't know how I knew, I just knew. And I've always had dreams monthly of tidal waves and tsunamis and nuclear. So <laughs> I've often been a little bit of a strange child. Um, and so what we're living now is not such a great surprise, actually. In the book, I'm covering everything, including boundary making, intimacy, even going into sacred sexuality, the whole human lifestyle and how we can say yes and welcome to the rising of that feminine force that will one day respond. Voice is one thing. Actioning, like our good friend Athena, is another. When it comes, it is quite spontaneous. As I said, quite out of the box, very unruly, and quite innovative, if you don't mind me saying. I feel the time we're in now, with perhaps mandatory vaccination hovering in the ethosphere, COVID seemingly going into second wave. Well, it certainly looks like that in Europe, which is where I am. We are being shepherded towards a very slim eye of the needle. And I believe only us 
at our most innocent, most natural, most authentic, we'll be able to slip through that eye of the needle and come out the other side quite empty-handed and pure, harmonious and balanced. When I was writing the book, that was the kind of uh, impression I was getting. That everything was uh, backing us into this necessary and timely corner. And the reason I say timely is because this that we're going through has happened many times before. If we go into our ancient civilizations, whether we believe these continents existed or not, there is a belief that there was once upon a time an amazing continent called Mu, M-U. And a great big cataclysm came along, and that was the end of that one. But a certain percentage, percentage of these people traveled and made their way to another, perhaps real or not real, continent, Lemuria. Same thing happened again. Then we have Atlantis. And again, it's like, yeah, but hang on, maybe they didn't exist. Okay, Atlantis led to ancient Egypt. We know that one existed. Again, a fall, a fall from grace, a fall perhaps into depravity, so we're told. But there was a migration. Moses migrated people to the Holy Land. Then there was the crucifixion. Mary Magdalene, John the, ba uh, John the Beloved, Mother Mary migrated to Europe taking relics, wisdom, artifacts with them. So this, this rising and falling is indeed cyclic. I do believe that this energy that spurred me to write the book was very much under the impression that our current empire is also going to take a fall the industrial age, the patriarchal age, whatever we're going to call it, God knows what we're going to call it. But the great comfort, the great resonant comfort is out of ashes always comes the fresh green shoots of something new. If I could, I'd like to just pop back to this Gnostic story that I'm absolutely tracking with my whole life, really. Let's just say Fia's feminine is also Sophia. Sophia means wisdom. And that these archons, these influences, well, in the story of Sophia, they are her grandchildren. How's, how's that? to uh, like come to terms with and what i understand is at some point sophia as she regains more and more of her divinity and awareness and realization of not only who she is but where she's come from and where she's going which in actual fact is nowhere because she is already in her original place. So this earth journey is just a likeness. It's an appearance of her, just like us. But at some point on the earth journey, she will have to come full circle and address the grandchildren. <laughs> and more importantly, address her son. Her son is the Demiurge in the Sophia story, we would recognize that today is the one percent it's like what sophia has to address the one percent and get everything in order and balance because that is a, another very strong realization i got with the book it's not about fighting it's not about war it's not about getting rid of the one percent throwing them all in prison it's about balance. It's about harmony. That element, the ghost in the machine, has kind of got out of balance. And of course, 
I don't know whether it's true to say, but my little human self will say, we sort of allowed that to happen because we got seduced by the TV, by the pornography, by the food, by this, that and the other. And so now we're throwing those things away. I don't want that. I want truth. I want to awaken. I want to take the scales from my eyes. I want to do the inner work that allows my mind to be my own domain. And every time a little archon comes in, be gone, be banished. This is my little section of consciousness. And this is the bit that excites me the most, although I have no clue how it's going to be. But this fierce feminine, this, uh, this Kali, this Sophia, will address the one percent. And there will be accountability and there will be balance and everything shall find its right place. <sighs> that was a very garbled message <laughs> of the Fierce Feminine Rising <laughs> book that I wrote. It is a good read if you recognize that you are in or have been in a narcissistic psychopath relationship. That person might be your partner. That person might be your parent. That person might be your child. So it goes from that little mini universe to bah, what we're in right now because it's the same element. This is the Gnostic path, right from the beginning of understanding Gnosis. We know straight away, there's a ghost in the machine. There's a, there's a thing, there, <laughs> there's a, a life form in here with us. It shows up on the outside and by golly, it shows up on the inside. It's part of creation. And this episode we're in now is because it's come out of balance. And like Mu, like Lemuria, like Atlantis, like Egypt, like the Holy Land, it will find its right place again. And probably show up in a couple more centuries. But you didn't want to know that bit. So I would like to go over to some questions if anybody has a question. You just have to unmute yourself. And I'm quite happy to ask, answer all the weird and wonderful ones you might have. I'm wondering, you've talked about uh, restoring balance. Do you foresee a time when we could achieve that kind of balance and maintain it as a stable world to live in instead of these um, imbalances that keep to seem to keep reappearing. I do, Wendy, I do. And I'll tell you why I do. I've been listening a lot to Dr. Zach Bush. He's the only one that makes human sense to me at the moment. I've got all my Gnostic theories and I love all of that. But I also like a bit of grounded, good, common good sense. Now, Dr. Zach Bush is a flippin' legend anyway. But he was saying not so long ago, this week in fact, that if we are above 18 years of age, we are not the ones who are going to do the transformational change. If we are 18 years or younger, it is these guys who are destined to start from scratch, not from ruin, from scratch and rethink everything. Economy, environment, education, nutrition, the whole thing. 
our job is to really big up that generation, get mm -hmm. them healed, get them straight, get them educated, let them feel us at their back, let them know we believe in you. And whatever life force and time we've got left, it is to plow into that younger generation so that they become simply marvelous because they are the, going to be the great innovate, innovators, or I'm not sure that's the right word, <laughs> the great creators of this new age. This golden age is coming. Perhaps if we are blessed, we will flip and turn off our TVs, stop reading the newspaper, and just start building our little permaculture garden and just literally be an in-person neighbor and friend and family member and just minimize our time to everything that's going on online that's what i've been doing and i have been having the most lovely moments of grace and like ah oh, the nightmare's over and then i come back to in tonight no it's still mm -hmm. here so there's pockets there's glimpses of the new world coming in I'd like to share, if I may, I'm coming off subject a bit, but I think it's worth it. Um, as I say, I live in the French Pyrenees, and my husband and I, and my mum and dad now, mum and dad have joined us. <laughs> They're not going mm. back to England. <laughs> um, we live in the Cathar region of France, and the Cathars, okay. you could say, are the spiritual descendants of Mary Magdalene. Now, there is a prophecy, a 700-year prophecy that comes to pass next year, 2021. And the prophecy, in a nutshell, is pretty much, we shall return again. But I believe that this we is actually bigger than the Cathars. Remember, I've spoken about in the talk, there was an ancient civilization of Mu, and a percentage of them moved and relocated, taking important artifacts and wisdom with them to Lemuria, to Atlantis, to ancient Egypt, to the Holy Land, to Europe. And one of those branches of Europe would have been our little region and the Cathars. I believe that prophecy, we shall return again in 700 years is the big we, the mm. we that, ha, you know, the rainbow serpent, the, 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 the good news is going to return again. I believe that this year is going to be dreadful. 2020 is gonna be, we're gonna scrape the bottom of the barrel. But I utterly believe and feel that in those early spring months, of 2021, there is going to be a very noticeable and far reaching <sighs> new fresh breath. So there are little pockets of good news uh, percolating yes. this, this terrible time. Can I ask you further about what you were just talking about? Sure. Yes. Um, I think that's just fascinating about um, how um, there are pockets of these um, place of, in these world where this ancient knowledge was preserved. And I was wondering if you could say more about that and which, loca which other locations they might be and specialities about the locations. Why were those locations chosen? What? I, I would love to be able to visit in the Cathar country. I'm just wondering what, what makes it so special for, for this kind of knowledge to be safe and, and stored for us. Okay, I might not be able to list all 12 locations, <laughs> but um, I, I, you know, I certainly can, can send you a PDF of them. All you gotta do is contact me. But for instance, we can say Mount Shasta is one. We can say that Maui is another. We can say Table Mountain in South Africa 
We can say Glastonbury Tor in England. We can say Lake Tikikaka in Bolivia or Peru. Um, it's those kinds of places. Um, they're often also known as the planetary uh, chakra points. So just like our body, beautiful planet Earth also has her own vortexes and portals. Going over to where I'm living, the French Pyrenees and the Himalaya has a very abnormal tectonic activity and telluric field. Instead of going uh, east to west or west to east, it's actually north to south or south to north. It is abnormal. Um, but these mountain ranges are also the most spiritual. This is where so many tribes and priests and priestesses and nuns and monks and sages and seers, they've all been attracted to these two mountain ranges. And us here, we say it's because it's Le Autre Monde, that's French, it's my French language. Um, <laughs> it means the other world. Basically, it's a vesica Pisces. You have the spiritual world overlapping the mundane world, and you've got this lovely little eclipse in the middle where the veil is awfully thin. And access to higher realms, dimensions, and states of our own being is so much more easily uh, connected to in these regions. Why Mary Magdalene perhaps came here? Well, there's a logical reason. France at the time was called Gaul, and the Romans were a very um, sea-level tribe of people. <laughs> they were no good at uh, navigating mountain ranges. They actually didn't have the lungs or the stamina for it. They had no clue about the shepherd passes. And of course, the Cathars knew the mountains like the back of their hand. So they were always able to stay many, many leagues up ahead. They, they just knew the passes, they knew the caves, they just, ah, no problem. And the Roman soldiers were just struggling in the foothills. Uh, wheezing <laughs> because they couldn't they couldn't take the, the the steep paths so that is why i believe mary was guided to come to this part she couldn't stay in marseille that was the second largest roman city in europe uh, the whole of the french riviera roman 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 but when you get to the mountains they just couldn't conquer that and of course, the telluric component would have mean, meant that her transmissions would have just zoomed straight into us. And oh, oh. hello, Anya. Hello. Uh, I'm from Vancouver, and. Uh, um thank you first of all thank you for your uh wonderful fantastic and inspiring uh lecture or uh, speak and uh, i'm i'm very curious that what is your uh, zodiac sign or month that you are born because your nature is different yeah. Well, I am a Capricorn. I was born on 22nd of December. And if you know your astrology, that means I'm only just a Capricorn. I'm very close to Sagittarius as well. And I think my ascendant is Libra, which makes it almost impossible to make a decision because I, I get that and I get that and I'm like, ah, <laughs> this message is here. Ah, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I have a question. 
Yes. Um, what do you think the role of women who are trying to conceive and having babies during the time of a pandemic and trying to call in spirit babies to help be that next generation of transformation? Is there any thoughts on, on that? I believe completely that whoever gets conceived now has absolutely agreed uh, vigorously and enthusiastically to be here at this time because those ones coming in they're going to be the crafters the movers the shakers the innovative I can't say that word. <laughs> they're going to be the ones that make it happen and I I understand that perhaps there will be um, concern now is not the the right time but I would say if you're calling in that one consciously and lovingly and maybe even addressing this at this stage. So whilst that little soul is perhaps looking in and hovering around, you would address that. You'd say, you know, beloved, beloved son, daughter of mine, you can see what is happening on this earth. You know, my partner and I want to bring you in. We, wanna, we want you to be part of our family. But you have to know, and they will already know, but we have to say it because we're human. You have to know and see what you are coming to. And we will do our absolute best to keep you healthy, to keep you safe, to educate you, to love you, to infuse you with all the goodness we carry. But if, if, if you're happy, I'm happy. Now come. I do believe that joy is really one of our greatest assets at this time. Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, bring, bring, bring. The newspapers and the news channels will be giving us the impression that now is not the right time. But there's a lot of archons <laughs> in those news channels. And remember, they are our grandchildren. At some point, the glory of what we actually are will come full circle and address that element, and we shall not be scared. Um, I have a question. Um, what if you don't identify as male or female? How does that work within the feminine power? Well, I understand that this is the, um, this is what is happening. I'm 50, so I'm like, whoa, I'm really getting into those elder years. But you know, in the 20 somethings, in the 30 somethings, this is precisely what is happening in this community. Gender is becoming awfully loose and fluid. And for those of us, you know, oh, I mean, look at me, I'm so flipping feminine, <laughs> but my inner work is a strong, sacred union marriage. I am forever working on my male and female energy. And that is what I believe the younger ones have really taken to the next level because there is a fluidity and many don't even want to be called he or she anymore. So this sacred androgyne work that my generation has been doing on the inside is now showing on the outside and that to me is major thumbs up and fantasticness. The feminine, perhaps, I don't know, I'm not in your body, I'm not in your biology, but perhaps you will be able to notice that the feminine part, even though you might not wanna call it feminine, is the part that wants to love, that wants to touch, caress, hold, soothe, forgive and anoint and the masculine part of you even if you don't want to call it masculine is the part that likes to plan navigate decide progress and get everything 
in a in a to-do list maybe you just notice ever so subtly those two flavors on the inside and that's how diffuse perhaps they've become for you so can you recognize yeah yeah no it's um it's not for me personally but my sibling is um they identify as non-binary and whenever i talk to them about like the i have a way of saying like sun and moon energy like yes. the energy is more mystical more soft more flowy and the sun's more like firm yeah that's it dominant and bright i mean in a different kind of bright but yeah, I, I, yeah that's how i kind of managed to conjoin absolutely it. and yeah. I am going to be watching this generation very, very carefully because to me, these guys have blended this masculine and feminine and now we have the third element. They refuse to be called feminine. They refuse to be called masculine. Therefore, a word we, a word we don't have needs to be made. And that word will take on a presence that is not male nor female. And that presence will create and dream and think up most likely things that us men and women haven't even thought of before because they are the third element. And I understand that these guys and girls have been getting a little bit of a rough ride because of them coming forward saying, hey, do not identify me as he or she anymore. Um, but I'm looking with incredible interest and support and admiration because something very interested, interesting can come through this generation. Um, I have another question. You don't have to choose to answer this question, but I um I identify highly with the whole of Qatar. Um, the with way the what? Qatar, yeah, with the Qatars where you live. Oh yes. And, yeah. Um, I wondered if you had any experiences with white ladies. Oh yes, oh yes, ma'am. I have researched every morsel every everything you can possibly come across on the white ladies have i seen one no <laughs> do i want to yes very much so i have some friends here who have seen her and they cannot tell the tale and no matter how many times they've told me every time they tell the tale of seeing her they cry yeah because of how much forgiveness came through in that moment her appearance made that friend of mine forgive himself thoroughly there was not one nuance of being left within him that was not forgiven that isn't that so healing oh yes you know I'm, I'm going around with little matchsticks on my eyes <laughs> just so because you know my husband and i we go out walking late at night we go looking where she's been seen we're, we're like waiting waiting no no nothing the sun's here again oh well <laughs> But she is apparently um, very closely related to quite a few Cathar castles, Montsegur being one of them. Very often seen by a sacred water source. And basically, I guess, she, so show, she shows up when it's precisely the right time. Mm -hmm. And when you need her most. Oh God, yeah. Yeah. Thank, thank you for um, sharing your wisdom and your experiences and being a fierce feminine power. Bless you. Thank you. Thank you. I have, um, I have a question that may or may not be relevant. <laughs> 
I'm Sabrina. I'm here in Maui. And um, during your call, I was sleeping and I, um, I had a, a powerful mystical experience and it drew me to go online and to connect and I found you and I've been listening in. Um, I, I don't want to get into the experience I had right now, but I'm just, I guess I'm just, um, my question is this time, just, just right now, the past couple of hours, I'm, I'm just curious about this portal, this time, this place between that I'm feeling, uh, if you have anything to say about that, you know, hmm. if not, that's okay. <laughs> oh. Glad to be here. I mean, today is a very amazing day. Uh, in the tradition of the church, this is the Assumption of Mary Day. This is when Mother Mary went from um, Mother Mary to Divine Mother of God. <laughs> so this is a big day. In the Gnostic calendar, this is the feast day of Sophia. So this is, you know, like Jacob, all hail Jacob for, for choosing this day. This is an incredible, incredible moment to be having this conversation. I don't know if that was your question, but um, hmm, that, that's all I have at the moment. And I, I just want to like really make sure we understand this connection with Sophia. Sophia to me is a living stream of wisdom from the very, 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 very beginning, like that continent, Mu, to this nanosecond right now, and this nanosecond right now. So it's that, that time spans and ever growing. And of course, it's not limited to human wisdom. This is the wisdom of all kinds of extraterrestrial life forms and plants and and planets and galaxies and gods and goddesses it is the the realm of wisdom i don't know why i'm saying that oh yeah fierce feminine so at certain times that living stream of wisdom will perhaps take on a face of the fierce feminine and remember that doesn't mean angry bitch and may take on the face of Kali or the black madonna or that more destroying aspect because that time in the cycle is here again so when i say fierce feminine that in that it, there is an aspect of that which is Sophia, which is wisdom. Because it's like, oh, it's that time again. Delete. Rebirth. I have no idea if I answered anything, Sabrina. Yes, thank you. I joined the journey that it just brought me through inside. Thank you. Mm, thank you. Can you tell us a little bit about your own personal story in evolution, how you came to this place in your life and where you find yourself? Well, as I said, my parents are here. They came out three weeks ago because I was coaxing them to France, saying, get out of the UK. And uh, we've all decided we're all going to live together from now on. <laughs> Um, and so we often have the same old conversation, me, mum and dad, which is, where on earth did you come from? <laughs> How are you the way you are? It's all done with joviality and, and bemusement. But um, was I, I don't actually know, although there was definitely a moment when I was about, it's in dispute whether I was seven or 12, mum and dad can't remember, neither can I, but around there, I was coming out of the main doors of the Sacre Coeur in Paris. We were on a little family holiday. I was holding my father's hand 
and I saw on the left hand side of the staircase which goes down into Montmartre this young man which looked like he was a tramp or homeless. He was sat on his bum, his hands were out as if asking for something and his head was bowed. I was very very attracted to him as I approached, as I went past and as I went beyond. So attracted, so drawn that I had to escape my father's hand, run back to this man, kneel down and put my hands on top of his open ones, which obviously caused him to look up. And he had the most amazing face. He had what I call Christ eyes, blue, wet, smiley. And because I was an only child and there was a sense of loneliness, in this moment, I knew I'd met a friend, I'd met a brother, I'd met a, a, an angel, I'd met someone amazing. And I cried and cried and cried and said, Mom, Dad, please bring him with us. Anyway, to their eyes, they thought I was interacting with a tramp. So they sort of snatched me and, and dragged me away. But I spent days crying. And I just kept recalling that face over and over again. And there was a sense of comfort that there was someone else on the planet. That was definitely a heart opening and sort of ground deepening moment. And from that moment onwards, I began looking for those wet blue eyes everywhere. And the next time I saw them, was in a church that my father had dragged me to because he was a Catholic and my mum was an atheist. So we, he snuck me there and I saw a picture of Jesus and went, oh, there's the big blue eyes again. Um, <laughs> that's about it, really. If I was to say, what elements have spurred on my spiritual quest? And it would be heart opening moments and that's really it <laughs> nothing fancy nothing special nothing really gifted just when my heart starts to open I'm not afraid of how deep that could be so I just let it happen that's it, really. Nothing more fancy than that. Oh, I can't. This is uh... okay. Uh, where do I find myself now? Uh, Fifty, and embracing elder my elder years. I'm trying to step into being an elder, whatever that means. Anyway, do you have suggestions about connecting to the wisdom of Mu? Yes. Apparently, in the lake of Tikikaka, there is a golden sun disk that came from Mu and Amar Amaru Muru, high, priestess, high priest of the Incas, put it there and it contains the DNA of everything on this planet. Cows, people, ants, trees, flowers, jaguars, everything. Okay, let me see if I can just wrap up with something. Something nice for you to, to take home with you. Okay, let's go to relationships. So, Fierce Feminine is also looking to come to a relationship near you soon. <laughs> and she's going to show up in both male and female, and perhaps those who do not identify with both. As the deepest, deepest part of our being 
that we have dared not ever shared before. It comes in many forms, expression, touch, look in the eye, ideas and spontaneity, probably primordial, not esoteric, primordial mystical beingness. Basically, we don't, we've almost forgotten what this might look like. At the moment, we are quite polished, presentable, well-educated, and sort of well-patterned human beings. And we fit into society nicely because we've, we've been groomed by society to be, you know, normal men and women and those in between on the streets. The fierce feminine is looking to come through all that patterning and conditioning and gesturing and communication and just pure beingness because it is the ultimate authenticity and truth of genuine being. There is a lot of people out there who feel that they have hit a glass ceiling in their relationships. Nothing's happening. Everything's the same. Little bit bored, little bit dull. And I often say to those people, hang in there and pray. There's that, pr there's that word again. Pray for the real deal to rise within you, which means busting open all those chakras for something we can't quite put our finger on yet, but when it happens, we will recognize it as something so familiar and so, so welcome to be seen and heard and felt again. Please understand that about us. Fierce Feminine, coming to a relationship near you. Another way it could show up is, you know what? I'm just not telling this lie anymore. And someone kicks the apple cart <laughs> or someone kicks the hornet's nest. And all these little secrets that we have agreed or maybe not agreed to keep quiet on just come tumbling out. There's the fierce feminine again. She cannot and will not abide illusion, denial, secrecy, bullying behavior, anything cruel and unkind. She will always defend the innocent and the undefended. And so please expect a lot of messy and inappropriately appropriate behavior <laughs> as you start saying yes to this. It'll be messy, it'll be loud, it'll be chaotic, but as I said, everything will eventually find its right and most harmonious place. Thank you, we covered many things. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Thank you for your time. And you can find me on Facebook, Instagram, website. And uh, let's keep the conversation going.